Thank you, Daryl. Good morning. Good morning. Please stand if you are able and join me in the call to worship printed in your bulletin. <clears throat> Excuse me. Forever is a very long time. We will sing of God's steadfast love forever. Forever is a very long time. God's faithfulness is as firm as the heavens. Forever is a very long time. We will judge God forever. In the long-awaited birth of the promised Messiah, may we, like Mary, proclaim your greatness as we rejoice in our Savior, Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Please be seated. We light these candles as a sign of the coming light of Christ, who is called the Son of the Most High, and of whose kingdom there will be no end. The hour of Christ's coming no one knows. Therefore, keep awake, for you do not know when the time will come. Hear the voice of one crying out in the wilderness. Prepare the way of the Lord. Make his paths straight. With John the Baptist, we testify to Christ, the light, so all may so all may believe through him.
With Mary we pray, let it be with us according to your word, for nothing will be impossible with God. Heaven and earth shall pass away, but the word of God endures forever. Let us confess our sins to the one whose mercy endures from generation to generation. Let's pray together. Gracious God, we anticipate the birth of our newborn Savior. May we are refreshed by the suffering and despair of our Lord. Our hearts grow hard with the hope of Jesus. Hear our prayers. Hear this good news. In Christ there is strength and wisdom, expansive love, and everlasting grace. We are forgiven and transformed with hope and the wonder of the love of the
And now let us go to the Lord for a few moments of quiet prayer. Savior God, liberate us from the sins which distort our vision and disrupt our hearing as we approach your word. Standing firm in your love, let us open ourselves to the truth you reveal to us today. Amen. The Old Testament reading today is from the book of Psalms. It is Psalm 89 with selected verses. Let us listen for what God is saying to us through these words. I will sing of your steadfast love, O Lord, forever. With my mouth I will proclaim your faithfulness to all generations. I declare that your steadfast love is established forever. Your faithfulness is as firm as the heavens. You said, I have made a covenant with my chosen one. I have sworn to my servant David, I will establish your descendants forever and build your throne for all generations. Then you spoke in a vision to your faithful one and said, I have set the crown on one who is mighty. I have exalted one chosen from the people. I have found my servant David. With my holy oil I have anointed him. My hand shall always remain with him. My arm also shall strengthen him. The enemy shall not outwit him. The wicked shall not humble him. I will crush his foes before him and strike down those who hate him. My faithfulness and steadfast love shall be with him. And in my name his horn shall be exalted. I will set his hand on the sea and his right hand on the rivers. He shall cry to me, You are my Father, my God, and the rock of my salvation. Well, here we are, finally, on the fourth Sunday of Advent. Uh, today, we are temporarily leaving the Gospel of Mark and looking instead to the Gospel of Luke, the first chapter of Luke, if you remember, is an introduction and it relates the events leading up to the birth of Jesus. And Luke begins not with Mary and Joseph, but with Zechariah and Elizabeth. Both, we are told, are righteous in the sight of God, but they are childless. Now, Zechariah is a priest when he is on duty in the sanctuary of the temple, the angel Gabriel appears to him and announces that the elderly couple will have a son. Zechariah expresses shock and disbelief at this uh, news, and he loses the power of speech until the birth of his son. Now we pick up the story as Gabriel delivers yet another startling announcement. Hear the word of God as found in the Gospel of Luke, chapter 1, beginning at verse 26. In the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent by God to a town in Galilee called Nazareth, to a virgin engaged to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David. The virgin's name was Mary. And he came to her and said, Greetings, favored one, the Lord is with you. But she was much perplexed by his words and pondered what sort of greeting this might be. The angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And now you will conceive uh, in your womb and bear a son and you will name him Jesus. 
He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High, and the Lord God will give to him the throne of his ancestor David. He will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there will be no end. Mary said to the angel, How can this be, since I am a virgin? The angel said to her, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore, the child to be born will be holy. He will be called the Son of God. And now your relative Elizabeth, in her old age, has also conceived a son. And this is the sixth month for her who was said to be barren. For nothing is impossible with God. Then Mary said, Here am I, the servant of the Lord. Let it be with me according to your word. Then the angel departed from her. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of all our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, for you are our rock and our redeemer. Amen. As many of you know, the birth of Jesus is paralleled by the birth of John the Baptist. John was born about six months before Jesus. His mother Elizabeth and Mary were related. Now that makes John and Jesus something on the order of cousins. Now, when you put the two stories side by side, as Luke does in the first two chapters of his gospel, you find some remarkable similarities. For example, both begin with the angel Gabriel announcing what God intends to do. Both have to do with children who are to play key roles in God's plan of salvation. And both involve an unlikely set of parents. Zachariah and Elizabeth were old and well beyond the age of childbearing. Joseph and Mary weren't even married yet. Now, reading these two accounts, it's clear that Luke wants us to know that these are no ordinary birth announcements. They're the preface to God's plan to redeem the world from its fallen state and to reconcile us to himself. Now this morning, as we make our final preparations for the coming of the Lord, I'd like to go back to Gabriel's announcement concerning the birth of John and then the birth of Jesus. And in particular, I'd like to pay close attention to how Zachariah and Mary responded. I'll tell you why in a moment. First, let's rewind the tape or, you know, go back like we do digitally now uh, to Luke chapter 1, verse 5, where he says, There was in the days of Herod, the king of Judea, a certain prince named Zachariah of the priestly division of Abijah, he had a wife of the daughters of Aaron, and her name was Elizabeth. So Luke then goes on to assure us that not only were both Zechariah and Elizabeth from priestly families, but they were righteous and they were blameless in God's sight. Their only problem was they didn't have children. It was assumed that Elizabeth was barren. Now, when Zechariah went to the temple to perform his priestly duties, he was assigned the task of offering incense in the sanctuary. And it was there in the Holy of Holies that he came face to face with the angel Gabriel. Well, naturally, he was startled. He didn't know what to say. So Gabriel said, don't be afraid, Zechariah, because your request has been heard, and your wife Elizabeth will bear you a son, 
and you shall call his name John. He will be filled with the Holy Spirit and with the spirit and power of Elijah. He will prepare a people prepared for the Lord. Now, it was at this point that the story takes an unexpected turn. You know, given that Zechariah was not only a priest, but a member of the royal order of Abijah, and given the fact that he's righteous and blameless in God's sight, in other words, he doesn't have a reason to be afraid. You know, we might have expected him to shout, Hallelujah! Praise the Lord! And do a cartwheel and shake Gabriel's hand and say, Thank you, thank you, thank you! Instead, Zechariah questioned Gabriel's word. He said, How can I be sure of this? For I am an old man, and my wife is well advanced in years. In other words, why should I believe you? To which Gabriel said, and I paraphrase here, because I'm Gabriel, that's why. God Almighty sent me to bring you this good news. But because you refuse to believe me, you will remain mute and unable to say a word until after the child is born. Well, sure enough, when Zechariah came out of the sanctuary and the other priest asked him, what took you so long in there? He couldn't say a word. All he could do was grunt and point, and make unintelligible sounds. Well, being priest, they figured out that he must have had some kind of vision, so they sent him home. Now, by contrast, there's the story of Mary. According to Luke, uh, he says, now in the sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy, and the angel Gabriel was sent from God to a city in Galilee named Nazareth to a virgin pledged to be married to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David. The virgin's name was Mary. Now, we don't know this for a fact. But most scholars believe that Mary was no more than a teenager at the time, possibly as young as 14 years old. We like to believe that she grew up in a pious home. Some even believe that like Elizabeth and Zachariah, she was descended from priestly families. But there's no real proof about that either. All we can say and be sure of is that she was a young woman with little or no status or formal education. Yet the angel Gabriel appeared out of nowhere and called her name. He said, Rejoice, you highly favored one. The Lord is with you. Blessed are you among women. Now, unlike Zachariah, Mary said nothing. Luke tells us she was greatly troubled at the saying and considered what kind of salutation this might be. So the angel Gabriel goes on to tell her that God has chosen her to conceive a child and bear a son who would be called the son of the Most High God and who would inherit the throne of David, and reign over the house of Jacob forever. Now, it's true that Mary asked Gabriel a question. She said, how can this be, seeing I am a virgin? But that's not to say that she questioned Gabriel's word. It was a fair question. She had a right to know. After all, it was her body. And Gabriel said, the Holy Spirit will come on you and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore, also the Holy One who is born from you will be called the Son of God. Okay, well, here is where the story takes an unexpected turn. For given uh, Mary's 
tender young age and the fact that she's a woman who has been approached by this male angel completely by surprise, we might expect her to call for help or run for her life. But no, according to Luke, after Gabriel told her what God had in mind, she bowed her head in submission and said, Behold, the handmaiden of the Lord, be it to me according to your word. In his commentary on today's text, Richard Jensen says, Having told these two stories so that they properly stand in contrast with each other, we are immediately tempted to leap to judgment. Don't be like Zachariah, we would like to shout out. Be like Mary. But it really doesn't work that way. In the first place, we are all quite obviously more like Zachariah than we are like Mary. And in the second place, we have not as yet heard the whole story of Zachariah. Yes, he became mute, but his inability to speak was limited in scope. Once the child is born, Zachariah got it. His tongue was set loose and he blessed God in a wonderful song. Zechariah too comes to faith in God's promise. His faith timetable is just a little slower than Mary's. Um, remind you of anybody? Well, anyway, the proclamation for this sermon might go like this. God is a speaker. God says, I am a God who makes promises. I am a God who keeps promises. I made a promise to Zechariah. Zechariah, like many of you, was slow to believe, but I kept my promise. I made a promise to Mary. She got it immediately and trusted the word of promise. I kept my promise to Mary as well. In Jesus Christ, the son to be born, I make a promise to you. Some of you will get it right away. Some of you might ponder the matter for some time. But never fear. I am a God who makes promises. I am a God who keeps promises. I will keep my Christ promise to you. Okay, so here's the sum of it all. Two responses. One, sovereign God of grace and love. Or to put it another way, God is faithful even when we are not. God is patient and long-suffering and willing to wait as long as necessary for us to honor him as the Lord of our lives. This is the gist of one of the most beloved passages of the New Testament, the parable of the prodigal son. If you remember, it begins, a man had two sons. And it goes on to tell about how one was rebellious and unfaithful and went off to live with the Gentiles. The other one stayed with his father and worked without complaint. But when the prodigal finally hit rock bottom and came home, his tail tucked between his legs, so to speak, his father rushed out to greet him with open arms. He dressed him in his finest robe and put a ring on his finger and shoes on his feet. Then he ordered the servant to kill the fatted calf and prepare a lavish feast because, as he said, this, my son, was lost, and now he's found. He was dead, but now he's alive. And then you remember when the older brother heard about what was going on. Oh, man, he was furious. And he said to his father, All these years I have served you. and You never prepared so much as a goat for me. Well, with that, his father put his arms around his shoulder and said, You're right. 
I should have done better. It's just that you are with me always. All that I have is yours. I'm sorry, but don't you see? Your brother has come home, and that's reason to rejoice. Come on, let's celebrate together. Two responses. One, sovereign God of grace and love. Well, this is what I hope you'll get out of the sermon this morning. Even today, God calls us and invites us to be part of his kingdom. Sometimes we hear him. Sometimes we don't. Sometimes we're faithful and obedient and quick to respond. And heaven knows, sometimes we are obstinate and rebellious and don't want to be bothered. Through it all, God is faithful to us, pouring out his blessings of grace and love, whether we deserve it or not. Nowhere is that made more clear than in the person of Jesus Christ, who came to earth as a baby born in Bethlehem and who grew up as a carpenter's son in Nazareth and who went on to die on the hill of Golgotha for forgiveness of our sins. He died for you and for me that we might be reconciled to God and given the gift of eternal life. So, how are you going to respond to that? Like Zachariah, doubtful and questioning? Or like Mary, receptive and humble? Christina Rossetti pondered this question well over a century and a half ago. Here's how she answered it in the hymn that we just sang. What can I give him, poor as I am? If I were a shepherd, I would bring a lamb. If I were a wise man, I would do my part. Yet what can I give him? Give him my heart. Thanks be to God, through Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen. And now, having heard the word of the Lord read and proclaimed, let us rise in body or in spirit as we are able and proclaim what we believe. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits on the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. You may be seated. Let us pray. Savior God, the season of Advent has led us to prepare our lives and hearts for the birth of your Son. But we question the readiness of ourselves and our world. We know well what the poet Madeline Lingle writes. This is no time for a child to be born with the earth betrayed by war and hate. Yet you, O oh God, risk being born in a world such as this. You risk taking on flesh that is fragile, vulnerable, and new. Oh, wonder of wonders and joy of joys. Everlasting God, your promised presence is a stark reminder of hope. As we find our way into pews and pulpit today, we come to give you honor and praise. 
We come grateful for all the good gifts with which we have been blessed. We come to pray for those who are especially in need of hope. We pray for an end to the warring madness for the people of Israel and Gaza, for the suffering in Ukraine, for the humanitarian crisis in the Congo, and for an end to terrorism around the globe. We pray for innocents trapped under falling bombs. We pray for peaceful diplomatic solutions to age-old conflicts. May your kingdom come, Savior of the nations, and your will be done. Gracious God, bind us together in faith and service. Enlighten us to the needs and the needy in our communities. Organize us for action to solve systemic problems. Help us make room in our communities for weary travelers, people like Mary and Joseph in need of a safe place to stay. You've given us abundant resources. Help us to share what we have. Extend the table of fellowship and make room for those who long to belong. God of compassion, bless us and those we love. Heal those suffering from the illnesses of winter. Strengthen those undergoing chemotherapy, radiation, or other painful treatments. Comfort those who have recently lost loved ones, those mourning empty seats at holiday tables. Renew those needing respite. Grant them the blessing of holiday Sabbath. As you reach out to us through Jesus Christ, Help us to reach out to those who suffer and struggle. Mighty God, whose word we trust and whose spirit enables us to pray, accept our request and further those which will bring about your purpose for our world. Finally, hear us as we pray together the prayer Jesus taught. Our Father, who art in With joy and gratitude for all that we have been given, let us offer our tithes and gifts to God. And the offering plates are still behind, uh, back at the double doors for your convenience.
Let us pray. Gracious God, accept these gifts in grateful response for your generosity. May these gifts bring joy to those most in need of Christ's mission and ministry. Amen.
as we go forth from this place, remember that wherever you go, God is sending you. Wherever you are, God has put you there because God has a purpose in your being there. Christ, who dwells within you, has something he wants to do through you. And God has given you the Holy Spirit to guide you, equip you, and sustain you along the way. Believe it and go in peace to love and serve the Lord. And now, may the grace of God, the love of Jesus Christ, and the peace and fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all, now and forevermore. Amen. Thank you.